uh, this month's Master Gardener event in association with Centerville Library. Uh, we are fortunate to have two Master Gardeners with us today. We have Lisa, who's going to be offering our presentation. We also have Karen, who will be uh, looking out for your questions in the chat. Uh, do post them as you think of them, so we can answer them at the end. But as for today's talk, uh, we are very fortunate to have Lisa here. Uh, she's been growing wine grapes for the past 15 years and more recently expanded into table grapes but to provide her family with summertime Stacey treats but, and a season, uh, seasonally shaded interway. Uh, she's also been a master gardener since 2011 and has completed the Managing the Small Vineyard course through UC Davis Extension. Um, Lisa, if you'd like to start, um, okay. thank you again. Great, thank you so much, Ross. Um, and thanks everyone for joining in. Um, this is a fun topic for me, um, just given the amount of time um, I spent working on grapes, even from when I was uh, five years old, we had a conquered grape plant outside and mom always knew I was tasting because I'd come back with my purple grin. So, um, so it's something I like talking about. Um, in this particular session, um, I'd like to focus on kind of an overview. Um, there's really a lot to know about going, growing grapes. Um, we've been doing it for years. Um, humans that is. And I'm hoping to give um, everyone a little bit of an overview of, of what's involved in both establishing or planting grapes, deciding, you know, when to actually go for, you know, growing of grapes, and then also talk about what it's like to grow and maintain and some of the things you might uh, need to experience um, as you go along in your journey. So I'm going to start by talking about um, where you get, where you would put your grapes, so specifically site selection. Um, then talking about what you're gonna plant. So talk about the different varieties that we can grow here in Santa Clara County. Then I, I'll dig into what you'll need to do to get them established and the first couple of years getting them to grow and train. Um, vines can be very flexible, but their flexibility means that you do need to pay attention to make sure they grow in a way that's gonna benefit you, be it for aesthetics, be it for fruit, be it for wine. Then um, at that point, I'd like to go and I'll take you through an average year um, for the vines themselves and what you as the gardener or the caretaker you need to know about each um, season. And of course, as gardeners, after we start with spring, that's what I'll be starting and going from there. I'll, we'll be taking um, a few breaks here and there. Again, Karen's working with me. It, as you have questions as we go along, I'll ask you to just type them into the chat. Um, we aren't gonna use the hand raise or any section like that. If you can just type them in chat, Karen will keep an eye on them. We're gonna try to amass them into um, a few places within the presentation. Uh, we're gonna try to get to as many as we can in presentations like this, these often we have more questions that we can get to. So again, we're gonna do our best. If we can't get to your question, we will send you um, resources to go to our help desk to be able to get those questions answered for you. So we'll kick it off. So site selection. So where are you gonna plant grapes? Um, like many other food crops you grow, uh, grapes like full sun. And when we say full sun, we mean at least seven hours a day during their growing season, which again is usually from March through about uh, September, October um, is generally when harvest is gonna happen. So you want a nice sunny spot for them. Irrigation wise, grapes require less water than a lot of other fruit crops you're gonna grow, but they still need water. And especially during the first, you know, one, two, three years, they're gonna be needing fairly regular water. Um, during that time, it's very important to get those roots established. And it's important to keep a fairly moist root zone, um, especially in the first year. As the years don't go on though, you're gonna basically increase the duration of your watering, but reduce the frequency um, to the point where once they're mature vines, they can you know, often go two weeks without needing watering. So when you pick your site, you wanna make sure it's somewhere where you are able to irrigate them and are able to get that water to them um, you know, when they need it. So for, for as far as soil goes, um, grapes are actually pretty forgiving with soil. Um, grapes are known to grow. They're actually considered, um, historically speaking, a marginal crop. So um, if there's a plot of land with some hillside or some soil that's not as great versus a nice flat area with fertile soil, the flatter is where they, you know, you would plant your vegetables and some of your, you know, regular crops. And then the marginal crops, things like grapes and olives can be planted on hillside or in that rocky chunk of land. So they generally do fine, even with soils that aren't um, as uh, nutrient rich or aren't as perfect. The one thing they will need though is good drainage. Um, so you will wanna pick a site somewhere where the grapes can get water into the root zone, but also that the water drains pretty well. 
And I'll talk a little bit more about how to measure for that when we talk about actually getting the planting in. So those are the, the biggest on site and it's all about you know, soil, sun, water, which is what plants really need to grow. Uh, varieties. So the varieties that we can grow here in California are pretty impressive because we live here in this Mediterranean climate. Um, here on the map, we've got illustrations of where these Mediterranean climates are. And if you uh, know anything about, you know, drinking wine, European wine grapes, you'll notice that a lot of these red areas also double as places that grow wine grapes, um, you know, and you get really good wines from these areas. So we are lucky enough to be in that area. So we are able to grow the Vitis vinifera, which is the European uh, wine grapes, um, and also European tail grapes, things like Thompson seedless, flame seedless. They're actually Vitis vinifera, which is a very, um, it's, a, it's the European um, grape. We can also grow Vitis labrusca. So that's basically the North American and the North American hybrid grapes. These are gonna be, um, think Concord grapes. They're gonna be <laughs> very grapey for lack of a better term. Um, almost a musky taste um, to them. Um, they also usually have a slip skin on them. So if you're into making jams or preserves or, or want to be skinning them, you can actually get the skins off them. Uh, whereas the Vitis viniferas don't really skin, it's all one element. Um, the benefit for the rest of the country, and also to some extent us, is that the Vitis labrusca are much more cold tolerant. Um, when I talk to people growing grapes in the Midwest or even the East Coast, uh, they aren't pl planting the Merlot and the Cabernet Sauvignon. They're planting Norton and other hybrids that are that are um, have the Vitis labrusca, and so they have the cold, uh, the ability to survive the cold temperatures. And then another option we have is good old Vitis Californica. So basically a Californian variety. Um, there's a, a very popular ornamental grape called Rogers Red. Um, I'll have pictures of it later for you. Um, it is a Californian based wine grape. It, it, I'm sorry, not a wine grape, California based grape. Mostly it is an edible grape, but it's mostly grown for its um, aesthetics. It's very beautiful. It's also very drought tolerant. It can get by with very little water. So you see it in a lot of native landscapes and places where you want um, a little bit of shade, a little bit of fall color um, with not a lot of uh, water use. So that is, a, that is a good thing there. So um, again, so here in California, we can grow any of these types of grapes. Uh, rootstock is going to impact uh, disease resistance and vigor specifically. So um, so Vitis, vinifera, Vitis vinifera, for example, the European um, wine and table grapes, often here in Northern California and actually now in Europe, uh, they are put onto a rootstock that is part Vitis labrusca. It's a North American rootstock um, that protects them against things like Phoxera, um, which wiped out a lot of both France's and our grapes um, in decades past, and also protect, protect, protects against nematodes, uh, which again can be impactful for grapes. So um, depending on your location and how big a planting you're going to be doing, you will want to look at rootstock because you will want to choose one that's appropriate for your site. And again, this is one of those very complex topics I will just dust on to make sure that the, uh, the, the basics are, are, are there. Okay, so the fun part. So once we talk about the type of grapes, uh, really we like to think about what fruit are we gonna get out of these, or at least I do. Uh, so there's, there's many, many varieties of table grapes you can grow. Um, so I'll start with some of the white table grapes. So you'll notice on the bottom of the slide here, um, and it looks like uh, um, we might be able to post in the chat too. Um, we have a web page that has specifics on grapes that grow well here in our county. We've done uh, trials over the years where we've grown grapes, we've tasted them, um, and done an evaluation of which ones do well here in our county. So these are a list of some of the ones that tested especially well. There are obviously additional grapes you can grow. Um, but these, again, tend to do well um, and, and and again, we can grow here in our area. So the one thing that you'll notice, um, so this cluster on the left here is a Thompson seedless. Um, and I had a lot of people question me, that's not Thompson seedless. I buy those in the store. They're bigger. These look really small. They're, you know, that's not a Thompson seedless. Uh, it turns out when you grow grapes um, in a home environment or, you know, without uh, girdling and, and other um, acid 
additions, um, the grapes are generally tend to be smaller. They're going to tend to be tastier. Um, so this, I believe, is a feature of growing your own grapes is that they're smaller, they're more tender, they've got a lot more flavor to them. Uh, the Thompson seedless you buy in the store, usually they're either, um, to get the grapes the size they are, uh, they're either girdled, so they'll actually cut a little bit into the trunk to get to the cambium layer to make sure that the water goes into the grape but not out of the grape. Um, or they'll s s spray um, something called GA, which is a uh, uh, gibberellic acid, um, which is again, something that will increase berry size. It's something you can do in your own you know, backyard, in your own home, uh, vineyard but most of the time you know again when master gardeners have done this we find you know except the small grapes that are tastier if you want those big grapes just go buy them from the supermarket so as you look at some of these uh grape varieties again there will be uh you know differences from what you see in the store Moving on to red table grapes. Um, as you can see, when we say red grapes, <laughs> there's a variety of colors to be honest. Um, and again, these will have different profiles. You'll get grapes that are a little more on the grapey side of things, a little more of the Concord if you go for some of the American hybrids. Uh, the Europeans are gonna be a little more straightforward sweet. Again, not quite as much of that musky flavor to them. Um, these can be super beautiful. I mean, they all start out green and then when they hit what's called verasion is the technical term, they will start to turn um, the color that you will then harvest and eat them at. Um, and while the colors of the grapes are fun and interesting and can be beautiful in the garden, um, you'll also wanna pay attention to the leaf color. Um, as you investigate and decide what grapes to plant, often, and some of my grapes are actually chosen specifically not for the fruit, but the leaf color they develop in the fall because it is nice to have some of those fall colors here in California. Uh, as far as wine grapes, uh, most of the grapes, again, that can be grown anywhere from the North Coast down to Temecula here in California, we can grow here in Santa Clara County. We're luckily right in the middle of those two areas, areas so it gives us a, a feel for what we can grow. Um, here we've got them sorted. This is by um, Farm Advisors but um, here in the state of California. They classified, they're not necessarily scientific, but straightforward in terms of there's wine grapes that are easy to grow, less easy to grow and challenging to grow. And there's a variety of reasons for this. Generally, um, the wine grapes that are less easy are a little more susceptible to powdery mildew, which is the main thing we need to prevent for here in this area, which I'll cover when we go through a year in the life of the grapes. Um, challenging, you know, for example, Sangiovese. Sangiovese's clusters, often they ripen very unevenly. So it's challenging in that when you go to harvest, if you are planning on making, you know, a Chianti like Sangiovese, suddenly you've got ripening issues where some grapes are ripe and some aren't. So that makes it a little bit more challenging it, it, to grow them because you want to make sure they're, they're, they all ripen at the same time. So those are examples of what makes something less easy and challenging as far as wine grapes. Um, and, and again, most of the Vitis vinifera grapes and the wine grapes you're gonna grow are gonna be on a root stock that is a, a domestic root stock. So many, many options for these grapes. Um, so what to space? Now we wanna talk about um, spacing. So how much space are you gonna need if you wanna plant these different grapes? And sadly, I hate this answer, but uh, how much space you need is very <laughs> highly variable. Um, it depends a lot on what variety you're growing, what kind of trellis and support system you plan on providing them, um, and what kind of soil nutrients. We mentioned that often grapes do well in some soil that's not quite as rich and fertile. In those cases, you're going to get a less um, viney and less productive vine, which often is a good thing for especially people growing in their backyards. Um, the rough rules of thumb, and I'll get a little more in detail when I talk about trellising systems. Uh, generally, spacing when it's in a row or like if you're along a fence line in your home, roughly it's one vine for every eight to 12 feet, again, depending on you know what kind of vigor um, you want um, and how you trellis and whatnot. So about, again, one every eight feet is kind of the spacing if it's on a line. Uh, Vine density, if you're planting an arbor, so if you're planting one that you're planning on having arch over an entryway or on an arbor or something, it's roughly one vine per 50 to 100 square feet. 50 is a good rule of thumb. Um, so, you know, a five by 10 area could be covered by one vine in theory. Um, so these are, again, good rules of thumb. If you're looking at an area and want to plant grapes, how many can you support? How many do you want to support based on uh, what's there? 
So I mentioned uh, it's highly variable. So this is uh, an, an outlier, as a statistician say. Um, this is an example of the Winkler vine. It was a famous vine that they grew at UC Davis. Of course, UC Davis famous for their viticulture program. Um, lots of people taking classes on how to grow grapes there. This one got to be a 60 feet by 60 feet, that trunk covered a 60 foot by 60 foot arbor. Um, it was getting one more than one ton of fruit per year in its heyday when it was at its maximum production. Um, it lived 1979 to 2008. So, um, you know, I this is in uh, Yolo Loam, which is a very high quality, very nice soil. It had dozens of students tending to it every day. So you can't necessarily expect this performance in your backyard, but it just shows that, yeah, grapes can be very vigorous and depending on how you prune, prune them, they can do quite well. All right, so one question I get, um, so table grapes are great. You plant table grapes, as they're ripe and tasty, you pick them and you eat them, put them in salads, give them to neighbors, fantastic. Uh, a lot of people ask, okay, so for wine grapes, how many vines will I need to make a barrel of wine? And um, people always wanna make a barrel of wine. So the rough math, how this works out, uh, you're gonna need about 60 to 100 vines, again, depending on your production. Um, that turns into 500 to 1500 pounds of what they call must. So after you've picked and crushed the grapes, um, you have a lot of juice and or juice and skins and seeds to make. Um, that'll get you a barrel, a basic a chew barrel and a little bit more um, because as the barrel ages, you need to take more wine and top it off to make sure that you have enough wine in the balance. That's gonna give you 60, 100 gallons of wine, which is gonna turn into about 300, 400 bottles. So um, I don't know how many of you have wonderful hundred vine um, areas there in Sunnyvale. It's a tough equation to do. Um, Money-wise, as far as the dollars to do this, the rough cost for UC Davis is $15 to $17 a vine. And that covers the end post, the trellising, the fencing, the actual plant, um, the stock itself. So there's a rough guideline for those who want a barrel of wine. The most common next question I get is how many vines will I need for a reasonable size of batch of wine? Um, so the map here works out about eight vines minimum. Um, will get you 100 to 150 pounds of great musk. That does one carboy. So a carboy, when you go to get winemaking supplies, it's one of the most common increments you can get supplies for. So it's a handy size batch of um, wine to make. Um, and that's gonna yield 30 bottles plus or minus by the time you actually rack it and get them filled and everything. Um, the cost estimate, again, it's still gonna be about 15 to 17 per vine to get everything established and get the infrastructure you need there. So um, so yeah, so those are just some, some guidelines as far as if you were thinking of going the wine, wine grape route, how many do you really need? Um, and it would be, you know, probably eight vines as a minimum, and then you would get to that, you know, six gallon sweet spot. Okay, Lisa, we have a couple of questions here. Okay. Uh, first, somebody's asking about um, how to how to find grape vines with the proper root stocks. How do you know what the proper root stock is for your area, and then how do you find a place, a source for that? That is a, a good question. So um, there's a lot of our garden centers here do a pretty good job depending on who their growers are. Um, so, um, you know, for example, if I go to my garden center, often they can point me directly to who their grower is and you can find out from them, you know, what, you know, what is the, the grape and then what rootstock is on. Some garden centers and some gr growers, to be honest, for a lot of backyards don't necessarily get a um, super robust rootstock. And the reason, reason that is, is in a lot of, um, uh, for phloxera and nematodes and those things, often it's kind of the, the coastal areas or the hilly areas that are, are really in need of the, you know, SO4 or some of the more resistant rootstocks. Um, some of the garden centers, they know it's gonna be in a fairly sunny backyard location, so it's not as focused. Um, so I like to go, if your garden center doesn't have information on the grower and where it comes from, I like to dig a little deeper. Um, there's quite a few places that do um, mail order. There's quite a few places um, that are commercial only. So in those cases, um, I've known people that have known to sweet talk their way into the right rootstock slash uh, vine combination, if that is something that they know that they need Need to focus on. Um, the other thing um, that is good, there's a good number of um, 
grape people that grow grapes um, forums and other areas you can get together and do group buys with other people that want a certain um, rootstock so and if 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 I think later on I can probably provide some resources as far as um, places you can go to do that kind of group buy. Um, but again, asking through your garden center and then finding out who their supplier is, is a great first step. All right, and the uh, other question was about uh, a Thompson seed list that bore fruit the first two years, but nothing for the last three years. Um, fertilizing hasn't helped. Is this the time to address this, or are you going to be talking about that later? Um, I, I, be, I could talk about it um, whenever. I guess I can bring it up now. So, and it's, it's a common thing. So you've got you know your, and it applies to grapes and a lot of other crops. But you've prepared your site, and everything does great. First couple of years and then it, it doesn't do so well. Um, the things I almost always think of is, you know, check, check your water, you know, make sure the water is the right amount. If you're getting good amounts years one and two, um, years three, making sure the water is the same if climate changed, um, not climate climate, if your conditions changed and the weather was different and there was less water than a year, it could be poor fruit set. Um, there's also some um, environmental things that happen when the flowers, when it's in bloom, if it's particularly rainy or windy um, during bloom, grapes are self-pollinating, so that can cause poor fruit set. Um, so it could be something that's out of your control that just it's what nature had in plan for that year. Um, the other thing to keep an eye on is grapes generally, um, fertilizing generally, especially for table grapes, you do want to, you know, keep you keep nutrients in the soil. Grapes are such light feeders, and in fact, often um, nitrogen to grapes, nitrogen sends a lot of the green leafy stuff out. Um, if there is too much nitrogen, it could be that the grapes put so much energy into the green leafy growth that it's not, it doesn't have the ability or it can't keep up and doesn't put out fruit for a year. So those are some of the things that come to mind at first. Um, there's some more advanced things on um, nutrients and whatnot. Um, for example, zinc is needed for a good fruit set. So if you're low on zinc, that could be it. Um, I don't, we don't necessarily recommend adding, you know, nutrients just to, for the sake of adding nutrients. At that point, you could do either a soil test, um, you know, if it's a big enough concern or, or whatnot, you could also do a uh, soil tissue test. You can actually, a petiole analysis is commonly done in vineyards where you get the, the part that goes from the leaf of a grapevine leaf to the stem, that stem there, you get the stems, you dry them out, you send them off to a commercial lab, and then they'll do the analysis of how many nutrients is in the tissues. So that is a little bit more advanced if you're getting into troubleshooting. But, but those are some of the big things I think of when I think of four fruit set. And one last comment, I think this was from Louise, that uh, about rare fruit growers, uh, they, they uh, offer grape science, don't they? Thank you. Yes, they do. So the California Rare Fruit Growers is a, a great organization that um, they, they, they grow <laughs> rare fruits here in California. Um, they do have a sign exchange every January. I, I don't know what the status is this year. It's a weird year, obviously. Um, but they actually, you can basically uh, exchange scions from other people. Um, and to get grapes established, or if you have a grape um, plant that's already in the ground and you want to grow a different variety, uh, grapes are pretty, um, they're, they're, they're a good candidate for grafting on to grow something else. Um, in fact, we actually did this, we decided we needed a little bit of Merlot in our, uh, in our vineyard. So we went ahead and we did bud grafts and we put Merlot buds in and three, four years later, now we have Merlot grapes in addition to the others. So, um, so yeah, so that is a good resource, especially if you have that rootstock and it's healthy and you want to different variety, um, that's a good, good option. So thank you. Okay, let's, um, let's go on to talk about getting things started. So the first couple of years, if you are planting on, planning on, you know, growing grapes, and again, if you already have grapes in, this is, uh, for, for information, might be a little helpful. Um, so we talked about how um, soil, again, grapes are not super picky about their soil, but they do want good drainage. And so you see, defines good drainage as at least one inch an hour. So what we do recommend, especially on, you know, when you're planting something like trees or, or uh, something that's gonna be there for a while, um, we do recommend doing a drainage test. It sounds very fancy. Basically you dig a 12 by 12 by 12 hole where you want to put your grapevine. 
Uh, you're going to fill it with water and let it fully drain, have the standing water drain. Um, so you want to make sure all the soil around it's wet. Then you're going to fill it with water again, and you're going to measure how quickly that water leaves the hole. Um, so you want to make sure that you get at least an inch, the water decreases an inch an hour. Um, is what you're looking for. That's not great drainage, but it's good enough drainage for a grapevine, um, to be honest. Um, so you wanna do that to make sure there's no show showstoppers, make sure there's not some hard pan that's just not letting it drain. Um, you wanna make sure the site is at least two feet above hard pan, um, three to four feet is ideal. Um, ideally, no hard pan, hard pan is ideal. Um, but you wanna make sure there's at least two feet before any hard pan happens. Um, and again, if you're not getting that level of drainage, you can always do things like fringe drains or do things to, make to help increase the drainage in the site. Um, the other thing you can do to help increase drainage, often amending compost, a couple inches of compost into that top 12 inches of soil um, is gonna help enough with the drainage or at least start the process of the soil being able to um, you know, encourage some of that macroscopic life to, to break down the soil so that your drainage does improve. Um, so that's something there. Um, if you are on a slope, we talked about how grapes are actually a good candidate for, for building on a slope if you're in that position. Um, you may need to terrace, not necessarily the you know big old rice paddy terraces, but you might need just enough, again, to make sure that the grape can go in and that whatever irrigation is given to them is going to get to that root zone for the first at least two to three years. Um, as far as soil amendments, um, again, because grapes are not super picky about their soil, often um, you don't really need to do much amendment. Um, if you do, um, I would recommend, or if, if you're considering it, or if you're thinking your soil is bad, or it's a large planting, um, we do recommend going ahead and testing your soil and see what it's like. Uh, generally here in Santa Clara County, our soils are rich in almost all the nutrients that the grapes, or quite honestly, a lot of other things you grow will need. Um, the two things, um, nitrogen, for most things, less so for grapes, but um, nitrogen is something that's depleted on a regular basis. So you wanna figure out how to add the right, not too much amount of nitrogen. Um, and the other thing, uh, soil pH, if you've got a, you know, a pH, if you have a soil that's a, especially alkaline or acidic, um, it might behoove you to go ahead and do that amendment at planting time to make sure you've got a nice pH level for um, the new plants. But again, here in Santa Clara County, to be honest, compost is probably going to be the most likely thing you'll amend. And often, again, it's like one to two inches in that top 12 inches of soil. So irrigation, uh, we talked about irrigating. You want to plan for irrigation before planting your vines. It's so tempting. You've got that hole, it drains well get it planted and then figure out irrigation later. Um, if, once you do that, it is, you can go back and put in irrigation. Um, irrigation could be as simple as you, a hose and a really good reminder system on your calendar. Um, it could be something um, like this here. We've got the drip system here. This is quite common in vineyards. Um, it's the half inch tubing with little emitters. Often they're just one gallon an hour. Um, placed, usually they're placed on either side of the vine to make sure that the uh, both sides of roots are getting the right amount of water. Um, and again, drip for backyards, generally drip with a controller is ideal. Um, and the reason that is, is that we mentioned how for the first couple of years, it's going to be fairly regular irrigation. And as time goes on, it's going to be less frequent, but much deeper. So with a drip system, you can basically just ratchet down the frequency. So instead of watering every other day, it's watering once a week, but then increase the duration because as the vine gets older, the, the roots are deeper. Um, so that's a, a really good option for, for people growing at home. Um, but again, you know, if you're watering as the vine matures, if you're watering once a week, twice a week, if you're doing some fur irrigation, um, you can get by with, you know, other forms of irrigation. But something you definitely want to think about before you uh, before you actually get things planted, especially if it's large scale like this one. Um, supports. I've talked quite a bit about support. Um, and again, before planting, you want to think about how the grape is going to be supported. When you look at the little baby vine, it doesn't look like it's it's like, oh, it's so cute. It's not going to need much of anything, maybe a stake. Um, that is not the case. Again, if you're planting along a fence, often we're spacing 8, 10, 12 feet apart they're going to need something to support the candy and support the fruit, uh, fruit that's growing on them. 
So, um, so here's a, a few examples. So on the left here, we have, this is probably the most common Santa Cruz mountains um, trellis system. It's called um, vertical shoot positioned bilateral cordon um, system. Um, so this is where you've got the one vine and then you've got two, um, I always held my arms out like it's a trunk. So two uh, trunks. Um, and from there is, is where all the spurs growing. So that is one system. And again, you've got here three wires to support it. Um, this on the right is a picture of good old Rogers Red. This is the California native grape. This is on an arbor. Um, so this one is planted. I think they've done every other um, where the main trunk goes up here. And then it's, uh, it's trained, whoops, it's trained so that it sprawls out to create that um, arbor-like feel. In the winter, it's deciduous. So in the winter, you're just gonna have, you know, the, the canes themselves, all the leaves will fall. Um, then you prune it and then it grows for the next year. So, um, so arbors are great supports. And again, they're a nice way to provide a little shade. Um, a lot of times um, on a home, you'll have some existing infrastructure. Um, this, I believe this is like one of those barriers that keeps an air conditioning unit in, in place or protected. Um, so this homeowner um, basically was able to use that structure, which is wood, solid, um, you know, and able to support a vine and use that to basically weave um, the grape and have the grape grow on. Um, totally doable. Again, you know, making sure that it's not doing any destruction to your home and that sort of thing. Um, there's also, you know, issues. We've got fire issues and, and radishes that we want to watch out for. But you can find things already existing around your landscape that could work. And another example, this is probably among the lighter weights. So this person has, um, <laughs> there's, a, looks like a utility pole that they're using and that is you know you've got this grape this one is you can tell by the little green shoots it's just starting to grow in the spring um so this one there it looked like they're kind of combining okay there's a pole it's nice and sturdy there's this arbor here that's nice and sturdy um these little twine like strings are used to get the vine to go where it needs to go to be on that sturdy support so um a lot of the 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 academics at the different universities would say that's not ideal. Higher grade gauge wire and something more sturdy would be uh, an, a better option. That said, this is you know clear that they are getting this to grow to the right place, um, even though it's you know it's using using what you have basically. But it's going to get those grapes to this support they need up here in the arbor, um, you know. And then once they grow, then that's going to take the support of the grapes and the vine. So it's kind of overwhelming. So what kind of support do you provide your grapes? Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the basics. So the first thing you'll be considering, um, um, obviously again, the variety, when you need to access them, table grapes, you'll wanna be able to pick on a regular basis. If it's something where you harvest all at once, it can be you know, in a different area. Um, and site figure is another. So again, if you're using kind of a lower nitrogen, not as um, you know fertile soil, um, you can get by with a less extensive trellis system because the grape won't grow as big as if it's in that lovely Yolo loam as we saw um, at UC Davis, the Winkler vine. Um, but the pruning method is probably going to be the most important thing. So when you go and choose your grapevines, you do want to be cognizant of whether you need to cane prune them or spur prune them. Um, those are the two, two I think, pretty much only uh, pruning methods. The, the fundamental difference is that grapes that are cane pruned, um, as you'll see here on the left-hand side, you've got this brown as the trunk. Um, so the cane is basically last year's growth. And so cane pruned varieties, they will only set fruit on the green growth that is from a cane that is one year old. Um, so for this reason, um, when you prune, you'll have one cane that you'll identify as, okay, this is the one from which I'm gonna grow grapes next year. Um, and then the one that you're growing grapes from this year, you harvest the grapes and you cut it down and you choose another spur that will then become the cane for the second year. So you kind of think every other year um, when you've got a variety that needs cane pruning. Um, so that's, that's some varieties. Um, other varieties can be spur pruned. Um, spur pruning is... Uh, and quite often it's what you see again if you look at the vineyards here in the mountains there's a lot of the common grapes that are grown are spur pruned. Um, this is where you're able to have your cane 
and your cordon, cordon is basically, um, I'm sorry, the trunk to the cordon, cordon in this case is a, a, a horizontally oriented uh, woody part. Um, spur prunes, you can basically take all that growth from a previous year and you cut down to two buds. And even though it's bud that, you know, fruited last year, fruited the previous year, whatnot, it will still set fruit. So spur prune, to be honest, is a little bit easier for um, someone who's new to grape growing because it's very forgiving. Um, you're gonna cut down to a couple buds and then whatever grows will give you fruit. Cane prunes, you do need to just pay attention that, okay, this is the cane for next year. This is where I'm getting fruit for this year and you just need to alternate. Um, so again, if you've got a spur pruned grape, um, once that cordon becomes nice and sturdy, the support it's going to need is going to be less important than something that's cane pruned. Cane pruned, you're going to need to have that um, support ready for the canes um, for each second year, if that makes sense. So this is getting little into the weeds, but hopefully this helps as you go to decide what to plant um, and learning also how to prune. Okay, so I'm going to give you some examples of trellising systems. So this is a, a VSP, vertical sheet positioning. This is, you've got a trunk, often two bilateral cordons, and then you're pruning on that cordon such that you get um, the right number of spurs. And again, depending on the variety and the vigor, um, usually you're trying to prune down to 12 to 20 spurs, um, two to three canes per spur. So you have a couple canes from each of those spurs. Um, and again, I won't go too much in detail. There's dozens of trellis systems. I've given some examples um, of each. With each trellis system, you can get more detail about how far you want the vines to be from each other and how far as you want the rows to be from each other. A lot of this data, to be honest, is aimed at the commercial wine growers, but it definitely applies to the home, um, home grape grower too, as far as the, especially the vine spacing numbers. Um, so this is an example of, again, one type of trellis system. Uh, another type that's uh, pretty popular and it's better if, you know, if you have long skinny versus more of a square area. Um, Lyre trellis is a way to, um, so instead of having the one trunk and the two cordons, they're taking two cordons and then stringing them out along the lyre. So it basically gets more grapes in a more square or rectangular space um, for your dollar. Allows a little more airflow in the canopy. Um, I think that's why a lot of people like this particular uh, trellising system. Um, you can also get by, if you have a nice vigorous rootstock, you can get by with fewer uh, great plants overall because you are getting more spurs um, and often this can, can be a higher yielding trellis system. Um, so that's example of another option provide a little sprinkling of options. Um, high wire cordons are fun. This is actually um, the high wire cordon. High wire, this is a wire that's often six feet high. So this is taller than me, I'm only 5'8". Um, you basically build the trunk all the way to that top high wire. And then again, you bring those, uh, those uh, from there, the grapes then grow from that top wire and often they'll grow down. This is especially conducive to some of the more American hybrids. Um, so yeah, some of the muscats and whatnot can do, uh, you know, really well with this type of cordon. Um, you know, as they, you know, come down, you've kind of got that neat visual. You can always also use this, the high wire cordon can be used for the uh, vitis vinifera also. Often in that case, the canopy is gonna stay a little bit higher up because they tend to go more up and toward the sun versus some of the more rambling American hybrids. Um, but yeah, this is, this is a way where you're keeping the canopy high and then the fruit's hanging a little bit lower. Um, so again, it works a little bit better with American hybrids, a little more uh, brambly. Um, we also saw, see this a lot in Argentina. Argentina has um, the issue where they need to protect from frost. A lot of their vineyards are higher up in the mountains. Um, and this actually helps um, do a better job to protect the fruit from frost as they get into the more um, you know, frost prone seasons. So this, those are some options. Um, trellis systems as far as doing an arbor. So this is an example, hopefully it's uh, visible enough. Um, this is an example of how someone has done three vines on a 12 by 12 arbor. arbor. Um, basically they've put the trunks lined up one, two, three along the base of an arbor. And then they've basically trellised a cordon to go all the way across the top of the trellis. And then they're doing two bud spurs here. So 
this is in dormant season, this is where it's pruned to. And then in the spring from the two bud spur, that's where the green growth will grow. And it will completely, this is the top down view, it'll completely cover that arbor, if not go along the sides and, and around and whatnot. Um, three vines is, is on the high side for this type of setup. You could probably get by with two, again, based on the 50 to 100 square foot per vine model. Um, but this is, again, an example of how you could do um, an arbor to get that coverage there. And um, finally, good old head train spur prune. This one's fun. Um, if you see some of the older, more gnarly vines, some of the, uh, the raisin varieties in the Center Valley, and if you see some of the old vines in Vindel uh, vineyards, often they look like this. Um, and this is basically, um, it's lower infrastructure in that you've got, it almost looks like a little gnarly tree. Um, and in this, this is an example where they've left eight arms and they only have one or two buds per spur. So this is for lower vigor. That's why often it's for the, 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 the old vine site plants where they're, they aren't as productive as they were in their youth. Um, but they do very well from here. They can shoot out um, and you're getting less fruit and less spring growth overall. Um, but it's a fairly, you know, fairly tidy and fairly low infrastructure way to be able to grow grapes is just to head train spur prune. And while often you see the old uh, vines being done this way, you can also prune a younger vine to do the same thing. So those are some example of trellising systems. Um, and again, in the handout, um, I do have a link to a uh, documents that give you a bunch of descriptions of different trellis systems that work. Um, and there's both for table grapes, for home. Um, there's also quite a bit, once you get into the professional stuff, because UC Davis is doing this for so long, there's a lot in the professional realm. Um, so once you've gotten your support system all figured out, ideally you've got it installed, you've got your irrigation installed, um, you've decided that your soil is good, um, it's time to plant. So planting is generally the best time, to be honest, to plant is in is bare root and bare root season is basically when the grapes are in winter dormancy. So often you get two year old vines. Um, they look just like this on the bottom. It looks like a stick that's not going to do anything. But those are indeed roots. They're just dormant. Um, once they get in the ground, get water and get the right temperature and water profile, they will start growing. Um, so it's just it's 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 probably probably the best way to get grapes and a lot of other fruit trees um, in and established um, to get plants that are leafing out in early spring is the next best. Um, and if you go to your garden centers, often they have the bare root. When they start to leaf out, they'll put them in a pot and then sell them as that. So, so that's next best. If spring is a better time for planting, there's no reason you couldn't plant early, even to later spring. When you first plant, uh, again, fertilize only if your soil sample, sample says something is needed. So, you know, if you have soil that's too alkaline, um, you, you might want to, you know, add some soil sulfur to make sure you've got the pH just right, um, something like that. Um, you don't want to give uh, first year vines, you don't want to give them too much nitrogen, you don't want to give them um, a lot of nutrients, they're pretty much just going to be wanting to grow and not over fertilize because they're really going to be focused on getting the roots established. Um, and again, compost, uh, compost does provide some um, nitrogen and other nutrients. Often the compost is really used for the soil health. So getting the soil, um, you know, texture just right to increase um, the ability for then all of the clay soil around your plants. The compost helps um, break that down and again, increase the number of earthworms and whatnot that come in and are gonna provide that circulation, if you will, in your soil. Um, and then uh, we talked a little bit about where to get um, your stock and the importance of, you know, looking for the combination of uh, rootstock versus the variety you're growing. Um, you also do want to ask around and make sure that you get virus tested stock. So um, in order to sell, you know, plant stock, it does need to be and you want to check to make sure it is certified virus tested. Um, there are certain viruses and other things that will be in grapevines and it's just it's in the plant material if you get something that has a virus in it and it's in your vineyard it's always going to have that virus it's never going to get better so you do want to again look for um, virus tested stock in addition to the right you know right and all that sort of thing um, so you've planted them. Um, so year one, uh, you're basically going to let them grow. 
Um, you're going to, again, water on a fairly regular basis. Um, for the first year, you do want to keep the root, root zone moist. Um, you'll want to keep weeds at bay. You don't want weeds to outcompete the grapevines. You want them to be able to grow. Um, and, you know, keep an eye on them. Make sure they're doing well. Make sure, as you see here, they've got this little grow tube. Um, for years, they were doing grow tubes as standard practice. Now it's pretty much to keep the little critters at the very base of the, of the, the vines from getting at the vines. Um, so keep an eye, make sure, you know, you don't have any, you know, critters or anything like that. Um, and you're going to let them grow for you. You're going to let them go crazy. You're not going to prune them. You're just going to let them do what they do. Um, because again, we're letting them grow, photosynthesize, develop their root base. Um, at the end of the year, more specifically the spring after when they're dormant. So the spring before they start growing again, it's going to break your little heart, but you're going to go prune that grapevine back down to two or three spurs. So we're going to let the roots grow. We're actually going to cut it almost all the way down to the ground again. You'll shed a little tear, but don't worry, it'll come back. And the reason we do that is that by pruning it down and letting those the, of the two, three spurs, you're going to let one grow up and become really strong. That's going to be a stronger trunk for years two, three, four on, et cetera. So that's what year one's going to look like. No grapes. If you do get grapes or flowers, we recommend pinching them off. Let just let the, the roots develop years one. Uh, years two and three, that's where you want to start to think about training that main shoot um, or shoots to grow his primary trunk. Um, so for example, if you're doing the arbor method um, and you want one trunk to go all the way up to the top of the arbor, um, year one, you've cut it back down to the two, you know, two buds or whatnot. As they start growing, you're probably going to select just the one and let that grow up, 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 up. Ideally, you want it to make it to the top of where you want the, um, the woody part. So either the, um, the trunk um, or the you know, arbor height, you want it to ideally get to that height in one year. So you wanna be sure that all the energy is basically dedicated to that trunk getting to the height it's gonna be. Um, so if you're doing the vertical shoot positioning training method, it might be to the three foot level. So it gets to the trunk, and then you're gonna let the, um, the side cordons grow in the next year, for example. If it's an arbor, ideally you get, the, you go to get it to go all the way to the top of your arbor. Um, so really your two or three is training it to, to look and behave the way you want it to look and behave in your yard. Um, even in year two and arguably year three, depending on your objective and how it did in year two, you're gonna wanna remove the flower and any fruit clusters you see. Again, let the grape focus on um, both roots and now trunk development. Uh, very similar, you're gonna water, keep weeds down. <laughs> you're gonna keep an eye on it, make sure that you, know, you aren't getting insects munching on it, you aren't getting rats chewing on the bottom. Um, keep an eye on foliage color. It should be a nice green you know, growth as it grows. Um, if it does, um, generally yellowing towards this time of year is very natural. Um, if you've got reds um, or yellows early in the season, um, you might want to keep an eye and determine, is there a nutrient issue? Is there a water issue? Um, is there a soil acidity issue? Because um, the foliage color is going to be one of your key tells of something is, is not quite right or something's okay, just not optimal. As you go on through your two and three, again, because those roots are getting deeper and more developed, you're gonna water less frequently, but more deeply. So you're gonna, instead, if you're watering, you know, twice a week, year one, maybe it'll, you'll be able to go down to what, once a week, year two. Um, you do wanna measure your water. You wanna make sure the water is getting to the root zone. Um, there's a whole series of information on measuring irrigation. Um, you can get a soil probe to make sure that the water is getting down to that root zone for your grapes, which is gonna be closer to, you know, one to two feet. It's not like the little amount for your vegetables. Uh, and yeah, so you wanna make sure you're measuring that and make sure that um, it's getting enough water, not too much water again, because drainage is important. And if you're putting too much water on the grapes, it could be that that's like not giving good enough drainage. Let's see, so that's the gist of getting things in the ground and established. Um, Karen, do we have questions before we walk through what an average year would we look do, like? We do, we do. We have several questions. I had a feeling. <laughs> uh, so first, I think a quick one, do the cordons stay pretty much permanent? Uh, do the do cordons stay pretty much permanent? Uh, pretty much, yes. Um, so um, I'll use the, I'll use the vert vertical shoot position 
vertical sheet positioning version. So up in the main trunk, um, and then the two side cordons, they generally left, last years and years and years and years. Um, every once in a while, um, there's some conditions you might notice, or if there's some damage to a trunk, um, you might need to manage by cutting some of it off, um, or sometimes cutting it all off and just letting one of the younger buds become the cordon. Um, so that'll happen um, if there's any eutype infection, if you get, you know, different types of infections in the plant material. Sometimes you can cut back until you don't notice that pressure anymore. If you cut that off, boom, you don't want that eutype infested branch, but the rest of the vine is still good. So you would let a new uh, shoot become the new cordon. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay. okay. And then another question about, um, choosing a trellis and pruning method for a specific grape the person asked specifically about concord but i think in general is there a a source a reference for what's best for what grape there is and i i do not have the handout handy which is bad of me i believe there's a link in the handout that will take you to um the uc it's a UCCE table that basically shows, okay, here's a grape you can grow, here's what its pruning method is, and then it gives other notes about it too. Um, when you purchase grapes, again, you can, you can find out, you know, does this need to be cane pruned or does this need to be spur pruned? Um, some varieties will accept both, um, which is a nice little perk. Um, that's how I got started cane pruning is I got one where I could do either one because I know I know how to spur, spur prune. Cane prune I wanted to learn. So um, so yeah, so when you buy, uh, they'll almost always identify how it needs to be pruned. And if not, there's a UCCE reference. Again, it's in the, I believe it's in the handout. Um, I'll, I'll see if I can dig that up and post it, but everyone should have the handout too, so. Exactly, yeah. And it's, but it's definitely paired to the grape and not, not the rootstock grape, the actual variety you're growing it will, that determines what the um, pruning system is. So in the inverse, if you want something that for sure is spur pruned or cane pruned, then you would scan, okay, what, what, what can I get away with spur pruning and then look back to see what you can grow. Right. Uh, a couple of people have asked whether they can grow grapes in containers. And if so, how big of a container does it need to be? That is a good question. So uh, the answer is yes and big. Um, so yes, there's a lot of universities that have, you know, done studies on, yes, you can grow grapes in container. Um, you'll want a very large container um, in the 20, 24 gallons um, size is what I had read. Um, sadly, the University of California didn't have a great size area. Um, but yeah, it'll need to be fairly large. And even though its roots are going to be contained in a container, it's still going to need the support because it's still a vine. It's still going to grow and want to grow and have support. So you want to be sure not only to have a fairly sizable container, um, but also have the support for it ready to go. Um, so yeah, and it's, you know, as far as, you know, a patio shade element, it can be a really, really nice, really nice addition, a way to get that summertime shade. But then in the wintertime, you don't have the foliage there. So it can, you know, be, you know, something that's actually sunny and welcome in the winter. So is like a wine barrel big enough? Let's see, wine barrel would be a half one, it is 24 to 30 gallons. So yeah, that's definitely above 20 gallons. So that would be, um, you know, one size. And again, barrels come in different sizes, believe it or not. So you want to make sure. Um, okay. Um, there's a question about uh, grape leaves. Do you want to do that now or later? Uh, great. Let's do it now. See where it's going. <laughs> okay. Uh, she just says that she's seen um, grapevines having bumps on the leaves. And is that a problem to be concerned about? Is it one of the viruses you've mentioned? Uh, bumps on leaves um, can be something to be concerned about, like a lot of problems in the garden and in a vineyard in this case. Um, often if there's a little bit of disease, disease pressure, it's not that bad a thing, but if it's a big chunk of the leaves or a lot, then you kind of want to, you know, look in and see what it is. Um, bumps on leaves could be so many things. Um, it could, I mean, powdery mildew could even present itself as a little bumpy. Usually it's more of a powder or not even visible. Um, there, there's, you know, a variety of boring insects, whatnot, that could create little bumps on the leaves. So at that point, I would refer you to the IPM site, um, which is our, it's short for Integrated Pest Management. Um, it's a site um, that I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with, but basically it provides you information on if I'm growing this 
I say crop, could even be landscape plants. Um, it helps walk through, okay, here's things you might see. Um, you can basically do some digging, determine, okay, bumps on leaves, let's look at foliar issues. Let me look at the different things that could happen on grapevines. Often doing that way, you can find a match and then get a little more insight into what's going on um, and do some reading on, is it a concern? If it is a concern, what you can do about it and what the UC has tested and knows is a good way to solve that problem. So, so generally things like that, I would go straight to the IPM site um, and start doing some digging. You can also use, if you're here in Santa Clara County, um, our help desk is perfect for that kind of thing. Um, as you see problems like this, take a snapshot, you can go to our website, create a little, uh, basically it's a ticket. You create an email that goes to our help desk. Uh, Master Gardener volunteers go through and we answer those questions uh, pretty much every weekday, you know, all year round. So, um, so that's another good way to kind of start to dig in to determine, okay, is this a problem? Is it a problem I need to address? Or is it something that a little bit of light damage won't do? Okay, I've sent them the IPM for grapes link Oh, great. Uh, and, uh, and if you're not in Santa Clara County, you very likely have a Master Gardener service in wherever you live. I will send a link to let you know how to find your local uh, service because they will be able to give you much better advice because they're local to you. Okay, I think let's go on. Okay, now we'll go and then hopefully I'll be able to take some of the more uh, diagnostic questions too, because now is when we talk about, okay, these are grapes and they're growing and, and here's where we're at. So, so for, yeah, for the vineyard, um, the start of start in the spring, which is what is technically called bud break. Uh, it's when the, the grapevine comes out of dormancy and you start to see these little shoots. Um, again, that little innocent couple leaves um, will grow to be eight, 10 feet long um, <laughs> before long. Um, so a bud break at this point, um, you know, if you've got, uh, if you're, you know, in a field or something, um, you're gonna wanna keep the weeds low, either, you know, hand weed, mow, use a weed whacker. Um, basically, you want to keep the weeds low, both because you want to kind of reduce the disease pressure right under the vines. Um, and you want to make sure those weeds aren't stealing water nutrients from the vines, because the vines, while they are light nutrient needing, they still do need nutrients and need to be able to grow. Um, so you want to keep an eye on that, that vineyard floor. Um, these little buds, um, they come out March, April. Um, as a lot of you could, might remember from recent history, we've been known to have uh, freezes in March. Um, so you will want to protect buds from frost if there is a freeze event ex um, expected. Um, it's much easier if this is, you know, on in, you know, an arbor front patio, you can drape um, a sheet even over a vine or something like that. Um, if you have more of a mass planting, often, you know, if you look at the vines in, in Napa, you see those giant fans that they have. Um, those are generally not to cool the vines, they're generally to make sure that um, frost doesn't impact the grapes, both on this stage, bud break, and then once the fruit is actually on the vines, less of an issue um, for that. Um, you also want to monitor for unwatered critters. Um, critters can be anything from you know, a deer that wanders through that decides that tender grain growth is tasty. Um, we often get any various forms of caterpillars this time of year and they think the, the uh, new growth is tasty. So just want to keep an eye to make sure that, you know, what is eating your crop is not going to destroy it for you because you want your own crop out of it. Um, in March, April, um, again, as far as water needs, uh, we've got quite a bit of water throughout the winter. So grapes often won't need much water at this time. Often they don't need water till you know, it gets significantly drier. Uh, but do keep an eye on growth um, and keep an eye, again, soil tests to make sure that the soil has enough moisture in it. Um, again, for a lot of us, we often don't need to do supplemental irrigation for months after this. All right, so um, you've got your little buds. Uh, April through June is basically when they're gonna grow and grapes, again, depending on the variety, can grow like crazy. Um, you'll be amazed where you see like one little leaf and you'll sneeze and come back and suddenly it's a, a three inch shoot. And then you'll go and you know sneeze four times and suddenly it's two feet long. Um, so yeah, so they will probably grow fairly fast at this point. Um, during this time, so uh, the first thing that we start doing is our preventive sprays for powdery mildew. So there are very few diseases and bacteria and, and molds and funguses that grow in California. We're very blessed that way. The one thing that loves it here is powdery mildew. Um, the reason is powdery mildew is a mildew 
um, that grows in dry conditions and it thrives when it's between 70 and 85 degrees. So if you do the math on the number of dry 70 to 85 degrees days we have here in California, um, that's a lot of disease pressure. So, um, so for most grapevines, you will be doing preventative sprays for powdery mildew. Um, luckily, the powdery mildew sprays are, there's many available, again, with a active uh, grape industry between table grapes, wine grapes, and uh, raisin grapes. Um, there's many options, many organic options um, that you can use. Um, I've got, again, some of the, the four biggies um, that you see the IPM sites rec recommends for powder mildew. Um, wettable sulfur kind of smells nasty. Um, it's organic solution. Um, that's going to keep it at bay. Um, a solid oil or just basically a, a, a horticultural oil that smothers um, the fungus. Um, potassium bicarbonate, that's kind of like a baking soda basically, but potassium instead of sodium. Um, it does a good job at smothering also. Um, and then the BS, bacteria stabilis, which is, um, which is another, uh, it's a um, it's a, it's serenade is the trade name. It's like a biological that would keep it in, in check. Um, so yeah, so the preventive sprays for powder mildew is something that you will likely be doing. Um, the other thing during this growth phase, uh, you might notice, this is when I've talked about looking at leaf color. You might consider mineral supplements again, if they're needed. Uh, very rare that they're needed, but it can happen. Um, and that you'll determine either from a soil test, a petiole analysis, um, if you do notice discoloration of leaves, often I recommend a soil or a petiole analysis to determine you know, what, if any, mineral supplements are needed. Um, at this time, um, it's hard to see, I don't have a great picture here. Um, so when you, depending on your trellising system, um, in this one, obviously uh, you often want um, a cordon with um, a couple, you got the spurs and you want two to three shoots per spur. Sometimes grapevines will kick out three, four, five, six shoots per spur. Um, so at this time, especially when they're really little like this, um, you might need to go and actually trim down. You only want enough shoots such that you get shoots and grapes growing. If you let too many shoots go out, it could be that that's too much growth and it's not going to have enough energy to set fruit. Um, so you do want to, again, do a little bit of math and investigation on how many, you know, spur, you know, how many shoots per spur you want or how many, um, you know, shoots that your vine can handle. And again, pinch off shoots that are, are beyond the above and beyond that. Uh, the other thing you'll do is you'll monitor what we call vigor. Um, so if you've got grapes that are growing, if there's too much, too much green, too much vegetal growth, you might consider less water. Um, you might look back and regret that you gave it nitrogen when maybe that was not a good choice for grapes because they grow like crazy. Um, but water is the one thing that you have really good control over is um, giving the grapes more or less water to help, you know, either control the growth or encourage growth if they're not doing as well. So that is kind of the growth phase. Um, June, July is when you're going to start to see uh, the actual fruit develop. Um, it starts out as just little flower clusters. Again, they're self-pollinating. Um, during this time, you're going to continue those powdery mildew sprays. PM is the technical jargon that they use for powdery mildew. It's that common that they have that. Um, and I've got a picture here. I laughed at this picture because I my backpack sprayer looks exactly like this. And this is from, you know, years ago from <laughs> a vineyard in France. Um, literally, I do four gallons on my back, mix up, you know, the solution I'm spraying, spray it with a wand. Um, it's fairly easy and it keeps you in touch with your grapes. You kind of can keep an eye on growth. You can make sure you haven't got too much, too little growth, all that sort of thing, um, while making sure that you don't get a bad case of powdered mildew. Um, the other thing, June, July, um, leaf pulling is a term um, that's used in both industry, both grape industries, both wine and table grapes. Um, as the grapes go, there's going to be a lot of green growth. There's also going to be fruit. Um, you want the fruit to be able to have uh, a good amount of circulation around it. Um, so if there's leaves right up against the fruit, that could cause issues. Um, for example, if there's rain or moisture, there could you know, be some uh, molds and mildews that grow in there. Um, also the airs need good circulation, um, good air circulation also helps control for powder mildew. So that's a good thing there. 
Um, so leaf pulling is where you're actually pulling leaves out of the way of the grape clusters. Um, so the grape clusters, again, have the space to grow. Um, and it's satisfying, you know, in your backyard when you can see the grapes hanging. It's also, a, it's, a, it's, it's an aesthetic element too. June, July, you'll want to keep it on water again. Usually June, July is the time here in Santa Clara County where we need to start irrigating um, grapes and, you know, various other things because it's been long enough since it's rained. Um, so again, and we always recommend doing, you know, measure the soil, um, determine when it's dry. Um, grape vines, the soil can dry out. Um, again, they aren't heavy water needers, but you don't want them to be too, too dry too long. So you're going to be, you know, letting the root zone dry and then irrigating when the grapes need it. And the other thing that keeps up in June and July is that vine training. So as those shoots grow, you've got your trellis system, that's great. They're in the trellis, they're in the arbor, they're in the fence, wherever you want it to go. Um, it could be they keep going. Um, so it could be that you're out there and you're weaving them somewhere else, you're weaving them to the side. Um, um, in extreme cases, sometimes you'll need to actually, uh, hedging is the technical term, you'll actually cut them off at the end to make sure they don't grow too far in the, in the right way. So, um, so again, because grapes are known to grow and go all over the place, there is some amount of training that you'll be doing throughout the growing season. July, August um, is the technical term is verasion, um, which is the basic of the point where grapes soften. So for white grapes, the white grapes are going to start to soften. For red grapes, that's when they actually start to turn red. Um, at this point, this is generally when we found that the birds take notice. Um, so once there's a color change or once they're softening, the birds will be like, oh, this is a tasty treat. Um, so it's time to protect them. Some of the, the more common things you'll see in this area, um, bird netting is one of the more effective methods where you literally take a it's a 14 foot wide net usually, and you're putting it over a vine. Um, some people need to cinch it at the bottom, make sure the birds can't get in there. So that's one option. Um, another option is down here. Uh, it is as simple as it looks. Uh, you take a paper lunch bag, you put the grape cluster in it, and you staple around the lunch bag. Um, the birds can't get to it, but that grape is going to develop just fine within that bag. Um, so that's a way to keep um, birds out. Um, and it's a little bit less less infrastructure heavy than having to do big old nets, for example. Um, the good news about once you hit verasion is that the powdery mildew that you've been spraying for preventatively, um, the pressure is very much reduced on berries. Once berries have gone through verasion, they aren't susceptible to powdery mildew. Um, incidentally, if they do get powdery mildew before this time, often um, the fruits get dry, they get brown, they crack, they just aren't tasty um, at all. Um, so after verasion, uh, the berries are fine. The canopy can still develop powdery mildew. Um, not necessarily a deal breaker as far as your fruit, but um, often the, the recommendation is to continue to spray for powdery mildew in the canopy even after verasion. Um, but for the actual crop, it's not as important. And then August, October, this is often when you're gonna be cooking your grapes. Might be a little earlier for some of the table grape varieties, depending on again, which ones you, uh, you pick. Um, harvest happens pretty much when they're ready. So for table grapes, it's just gonna be when they taste good and when your family's ready to eat them, to be honest, or friends or neighbors. Um, for uh, raisin and wine grapes, um, you're gonna be harvesting based on uh, more scientific things. You're gonna measure bricks, which is how sweet are they, and pH, what's their acid levels. Um, so often, um, if you are doing the wine grape thing or the raisin grape thing, you'll be harvesting and you'll be doing some, some basic chemistry measurements or taking it to a local um, supply store that can do them for you to determine when the right time to harvest is, again, based on those numbers. Because once you're making wine, it's more of a, more of a scientific uh, chemistry experiment versus just tasting and enjoying them. So then um, after you've harvested, fall comes and the leaves are gonna fall and you let them fall. Um, the leaves on the ground, as long as you didn't have a really bad case of powdery mildew, brutophytus or something like that, um, the leaves can fall if you're in a place where it's just soil on the bottom. You can leave the leaves there. So as long as, again, the disease pressure is low and um, there isn't a lot of inoculum that's going to create something for the future. Um, so that's pretty much where it is. If it's in a place where you, you know, want to or need to rake up the leaves, that's fine. You can either use them as mulch under the vines or you can compost, do whatever with them. Um, and yeah, you just kind of let them be. 
for quite a while. Um, in December and January, you're going to see sticks, uh, you know, either on your arbor or on a, a cordon system. Um, they are dormant. So they are dormant. That said, we do, it's better to prune um, the later in the season, the better. Um, and the reason that is there's a few diseases, you type of dieback is the most common here in Santa Clara County, um, that are spread when it is fairly uh, damp, when the air is damp or when there's rainy um, rain events. Um, during those times, things like this are more likely to get into your vines. So if you've pruned on a rainy day, in December or January, that's really a ideal scenario to get a U-type infection in your grapevine and you do not want that. So the best thing, recommended thing to do is to wait to prune, wait till you're closer to, um, you know, when that bud break happens. Um, and enjoy the fact that you have these cool sticks growing or this cool arbor that's, you know, cut in these areas. Um, the other thing that, that uh, might be recommended a dormant sprays. So dormant sprays are basically usually some type of um, fungicide, insecticide, whatnot, that is sprayed in the dormant season to keep disease pressure at bay. If it is needed, if you have a situation where that is needed, um, dormancy is a good time to do that. Um, you do want to, you know, be very careful. Often the dormant sprays are kind of more potent than a during growth spray. Um, so again, you want to spray only dormant spray if you with a purpose in mind and you need to find the right tool for the job and again that ipm pest site is going to help to let you know whether a dormant spray is needed for your particular situation so you've been nice and patient you've waited till february march to prune the again depending on what variety and when actually those buds break um march during sunny weather um for our grapes which usually don't bud break until early april um is by far the best time again if you can wait and can deal with the the sticks out in the vineyard um that's going to be best um and you're looking for again the sunnier warmer the weather the better again that's going to be the least likely time where you type it or something like that's going to get in the, as you get closer to March or closer to bed break, overall the disease pressure is lower. You'll find that actually when you do make those pruning cuts, the grape is already kicking out fluid, so it's going to kind of provide its own little protection also. So the later in the season, it's not as needed to stay away from that wet weather. Um, but luckily, usually here in Northern California, we have dry enough spells that you can kind of time it and get the pruning done at the right time. Uh, as another shot of pruning this time of year, again, in the dormant season, this looks like a nice, uh, based on the, the weeds growing, this looks like a nice February day. Um, this is pruning of that, um, the high wear cordon pruning, the six foot tall. Um, it looks like they're kind of mid job here. They've got these spurs um, that are growing and it looks like a couple of have a couple buds, but it looks like there's still these up here that they need to take care of to make sure that they've just got the spurs there um, that'll grow. Um, and, you know, you prune your vine, to be honest, the pruning and clipping, it's a little bit of skill in knowing what to do. Picking up all the growth from the previous year, that's where the real work is. Um, but, you know, view it as a nice springtime exercise and you're good. All right, so that's the, 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 the formal content I have. I wanted to share with you a um, little bit about the Master Gardener program. Then I'm gonna go back over to see how many questions we can get in in the few minutes we have. Um, so the Master Gardeners of Santa Clara County, we're basically a, um, we're a volunteer organization. Uh, we're trained to help people like you here in Santa Clara County do the right things in their garden, basically, all based on the science that's been done um, at the university. So we have, I mentioned the help desk. Here's a link to it again. Um, this is, you can come to us with any gardening related question, be it grapes, be it vegetables, be it, um, you know, California native plants, getting them established this time of year. Um, use the form to submit a question and master gardeners go through and help people answer those questions um, on a regular basis. On our website, you can go to our mgsantaclara.ucnr.edu. Um, there's a lot of information, not only again on grapes, but on a lot of different things you can grow here in this county. So it's hyper local to, to where we are. Um, a couple um, events we have, we actually have finally been able to open up uh, two of our gardens to the public again. So um, next Saturday, our Palo Alto teaching and demonstration garden will be open from 10 to 12. And then the following Sunday, we're opening up our Marshall Cottle Park um, gardens. Um, these are great gardens um, to walk around. Um, we've got 
some edibles growing, we've got some flowers growing, we've got a lot of water-wise plants. This is a great time to get inspiration for water-wise plants actually. Um, at these open gardens, we see open gardens, we're actually, we're, we're having people sign in, only a certain number of people are in the garden at any given time. It's very much a self-guided tour through the gardens, um, but we're just so excited to let people back in our gardens because it's been over six months. Um, and then there's a couple more talks. We've got um, a talk uh, coordinated through the Pelota Library and a talk through Santa Clara County Libraries that again, anyone is able to attend. They both are online. You do need to register um, and they're free, but that's, that's pretty much there. Um, and then I have a link for um, a survey for this talk. I would, we would love to get feedback on this and then what other talks you'd be interested in. Um, so there's a little bitly link here. And I think uh, uh, Karen's also posted it in the chat. Um, if you have a few minutes to click on that and give some feedback on this talk, we'd really appreciate it. Um, and again, we're also polling for what other things you want us to talk about or what you'd like to learn from us. So, um, so got it. Um, okay, I'll, I'll go to Karen. Karen, what do we have in terms of questions? <laughs> All right, so uh, we have several here. Uh, going back to the uh, the weeds and mulch question, there were a few. Can goats be used to keep the weeds low? Is there a recommended cover crop for grapes? Uh, are wood chips problematic for uh, American grapes? Okay. Um, let's see, those are, those are three good questions. Let's see, can goats be used? I, goats would be so cute. Um, goats can be used. Um, goats, they eat the weeds. They will also eat a lot of other things. Um, so if you are using goats, um, it would be a good candidate if you got really tall, um, if, you, you know, if you're doing that high wire cordon or something like that. Um, they'd be, you know, a good alternative for that. Um, people with a normal three foot high um, system, um, if the grapes are dormant, it's okay. Once the grapes start growing any green things, the goats are gonna look at that and like that. There is a variety of goat that's a very short goat that I've heard people have used with success um, in some of the more traditional vineyards. But, um, but yeah, so as far as um, keeping the weeds down, that's, that would be a great option. Um, mulching, um, we do in general, mulch is a great thing, um, especially right, um, um, was it right under the vines themselves? The mulch is gonna help keep the water in. It's gonna help keep weeds out. Again, you don't want weeds right at the base of um, you know, any grapevine because you want the nutrients to go there. Um, I've, I'm not aware of any specific concerns with Concord and other American varieties. Um, again, if mulch is used you know, on top of soil, we've got soil, mulch and you irrigate there. Um, and again, if the drainage is good and you aren't over irrigating, um, I'm, not, I'm not aware of any disease pressure there. Um, yeah, I, I would need to look in to see if there's been any examples or any specifics um, there. But, but generally when we see, you know, pretty much any fruit crop being grown, a layer of mulch is an excellent way to again, keep the moisture in, keep the weeds out, keep the soil temperature um, evened out. And I think the third question was on cover crops. Um, so cover crops, and you, you see them a lot in the vineyards um, in this area, it includes, in fact, we actually manage a co cover crop too. Cover crops are um, fantastic for, there's directly underneath vines. Um, generally that's better to keep the, the weeds um, gone, both for water retention and um, for, again, disease pressure, whatnot. In between rows, however, often you have cover crops planted. Um, they can be used to help um, improve the soil texture and increase, again, make sure the drainage continues. Often that's what mustards are used for because they have a big taproot that will actually help to make sure that the drainage is good in the whole vineyard. Um, you also have some cover crops that set nitrogen. Um, so things like fava beans, um, some vetches, some other things are used as a cover crop where they're actually helping to create just enough nitrogen that the grapes can survive on that nitrogen and you don't need to add supplemental nitrogen um, to, your, to your vines. Um, so those are, those are a couple options of cover crops. Also cover crops can help if it is a hillside situation. It's nice to have something planted that's gonna keep the hill in place to make sure that the hill doesn't totally erode. Mm -hmm. So those are some of the, the, the reasons for and what's used as cover crops. And it's again, a whole nother topic I can talk another hour on, so. <laughs> All right, there were a couple of questions about um, pruning and, and the, uh, the fluid coming out of the vine. One person says that her, her vine kept leaking for, uh, for days. Mm. And, uh, you know, how, 
is should she not have pruned so close to bud break? How concerned should she be about this? For all I've read about that, because I, I, I have done similar where I got and prune and I was like, is it supposed to still be oozing and dripping? And um, everything I've read is that that is the, that's the vine, you know, doing its thing. You know, it's, it's starting to grow. Um, it is providing protection. You know, it is protection for the vine. Um, it, yeah, it looks good, uh, bad and drippy. From what I've read, there's nothing bad about that. And again, if you can do it outside of rain or moist events, that's ideal because um, it'll, it'll dry sooner. But um, but yeah, I have I have not read anything that that is an issue. It's something that just naturally happens, and you'd rather have that than prune in December and have an infection get in the vine. So, and there were a couple of questions about watering and how you tell you know what is light watering, what is appropriate water, you know, what frequency. How do you tell when you have enough water? Yep. So um, again, another talk I could talk for hours on. Um, <laughs> water is, uh, uh, so again, for grape vines, um, the first year and perhaps two years, um, the rule of thumb is you want the root zone to be wet. So we always say root zone, root zone, root zone. Um, so the root zone of a very new plant is probably, you know, going to be within six, 12 inches of the top of the soil. Years two, three, ideally, it's going to be even deeper. Um, so knowing whether the root zone is wet or not, um, the most straightforward way is to go and measure to see is there water in the root zone or is there moisture in the root zone. Um, so the most, to be honest, the, the easiest, most straightforward way is um, they sell moisture meters. Often I have one at my desk and I don't right now. Um, it's uh, basically a moisture, it's a meter um, with a long probe. Um, you put it in the soil at the depth of where you think your root zone is. Um, and then it will give you a reading as to how moist the soil is there. So these, um, you do want to test it in dry and wet conditions to make sure that it works in your soil. I know some soils aren't, uh, they don't respond as well to a moisture meter as other soils. So you want to make sure it is effective for your soil, but that's a, a quick way to go and determine if the root zone is wet. So um, for years, you know, one, two, even to three, um, you might set up, you know, for example, the first year it might be you're watering a couple times a week. Um, if you water, wait two, three days, go see if the root zone is still moist. If it is, you know you don't need to water yet. Then you go measure the next day, still moist. Okay, don't need to water yet. Um, so you basically measure until the moisture gets you know, on the low side and that's when you'd wanna water again. So um, so it, it's, it's an exercise in diligence. I would love to tell you 10 minutes a day, three times a week, um, but it really depends on your soil, the drainage, how big the plant is, how much water it's sucking up, that sort of thing. Um, so that's why it's, 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 it takes patience and time, but going out and measuring to figure out, okay, is the root zone moist or not? Um, that's when to water. So again, on the young side, you wanna make sure there's always some moisture at the root zone. Um, in the more mature vines, you can wait and often you will want to wait till the root zone dries out and that's when it's gonna be time to re-irrigate. Um, so the rules of thumb, I know the University of California rule of thumb for vines is that you would furrow irrigate, which means you, you know, infuse the grapevine base with water um, every two weeks. Um, if you're doing drip, which they actually do recommend for home vineyards, it's going to be more like every week. And again, you want to keep the drip on as long as it takes to get to the root zone. Hopefully that was a very long topic in a short amount of time. Watering always is. I mean, it kind of boils down to you give the plant what it needs. So if we didn't get to your question, we encourage you to contact our uh, help desk. And uh, I will post again a link to our, uh, this, this talk will be available on our YouTube and I'll post a link to our website where we link to all of our videos.